this just now. Thank you very much, Rex. I was thinking about Rex, you know. I was thinking about um, how there's little significant things that happened in my life today. Um, when I first met Rex, I was in, I was in an isolation cell in Arizona, and uh, I was reading 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And Rex is the first letter came. And I had, there was other poets there. Uh, uh, Barbara uh, Moore, uh, Richard Shelton, and a host of other ones. But for some reason, they just didn't ring true. And I'm not sure what it is. What it is, it's like uh, Ezra Pound said, when you, when you see something momentarily, you sort of question yourself whether you saw it or not. Uh, like I do that quite a bit now with, with uh, elk and deer and mountain lions right there. Or bears, I'll see, I'll see a flash of something in the trees. And then, I'll, and, then I'll, and then my dogs will take off running and I'll go with them and I'll, and I can't see but I swear there's something there. Um, I sensed while I was reading Gabriel Garcia Marquez and I, wrote, I got Rex's letter, I sensed not only a brother but somebody that I knew was a true poet. And it just happened that today, to celebrate the true poets, is Denise Levertov's birthday. And it also happens without any sort of planning on my part. I was going through some boxes at the cabin, and I, I had to get something good to read. So I was going through all the boxes and trying to get a book that I could read. And I plucked. Um, Love of the time of cholera out of the box. <laughs> and I'm on a plane and I realize while I'm on the plane, this is a, this is, this is, this is a, I'm reading Gabriel really Garcia Marcus again, I'm, I'm coming to see Rex, you know. <laughs> and all these wonderful, significant things. Now let me just tell you a characterization on Rex because it's important to me tonight for me being here. And that is that, that I, I, I've lived a pretty hard life, but almost anything I do, anything, I do with an exorbitant amount of flair. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just wouldn't walk into a bank and say, give me your money. <laughs> I would go into a bank when I was robbing banks, and I would do poetry to the intelligence. I would say, shh, go hit a button or I'll shoot you, but just look, you got to hear this poem by Ezra Pound. And the DEA and the FBI would call me the poet bandit. <laughs> and they would look, and they were, they, they, literally, I was, I, was, I was on the most wanted post, right? they had me in post offices, and literally they said, in characteristics, look for a poetry book in his back pocket. <laughs> and I was like, so I had to quit taking poetry books and just put papers in. And instead of handing notes to the church, I would have poems. They said, you're about to be robbed, so don't start selling. <laughs> you know? anyway, anyway, I don't know how I got off on that. But almost everything I've done, I've done with great fortitude and great compassion. And um, when I was thinking about Rex, the only way to characterize my friendship with him would be uh, would be of things that are used and broken and then refuse to surrender. For instance, if you could take a balloon and put it close to the sun, if you could just imagine that the balloon would not burst. How much sunlight can that balloon take? And then when the balloon does burst, it still refuses to come down. So it just sits there like, a, like one of those Zen Buddhist bikes up on the mountains of the Himalayan Speaks, and they flutter. And when a heart is so filled with light that it can no longer contain the life that it has in it, facing and challenging the outside life, and then it, it implodes, then it becomes one of those Buddhist lives that others recognize as they give us faith when we too are climbing. Not an American flag or a Russian flag or a stupid Chinese flag, but red flags from the heart, you know? White flags from the soul that perpetuate our faith and our belief that we can combine the soul with the spirit. That we can't combine the mind with the heart and the heart with the soul and the mind with the soul. All these impossible ventures that we take off as romantic poets, you know? I remember when Russell Simmons on Death Jam was just a kid on a bicycle going to the Lower East Side Poets Cafe. 
And I remember Russell used to come up the motorcycle scene with girls and kids were, and they were all shooting up dope. And he would, he was talking shit like, yeah, I know I gotta go do my yoga in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and Pinero would be like, what? Is that some new dope? Is that yoga shit some new dope? Right? He said, no, 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 yoga's for you. Whoa, you know. And he said, you guys gotta put this shit up on TV. Now what's up with you, you know? Put this shit up with the stuff I heard when I was being yellow, like it's in Juegos, Tato La Viera. Put that shit on TV. And they'd be like, yeah, right, bro, you gotta get it. You got it more that dope, it's no good. And the guy was about to pass out. We had to go fall and put him back in the seat, right? He did it, right? And there's all these she did it's in the world. All these she did it's. It, it, it's an amazing story, but the thing is that I noticed about the Russell Sinners and the Rex Peters, and the Denise Levitons in the world are that they were all these broken strings, broken chain links, uh, pieces of uh, wood from the main mast hole that went drifting off by themselves during the shipwreck storm and ended up on some beach and no one's ever been on. <laughs> They're all pieces of something else that broke its, themselves away from and became renunciants on the edge. And so while Martin Luther King was doing what he was doing, Malcolm X was on the edge. And while these growers in California were barring you about gallon lions and lettuce, Cesar Chavez was on the edge. And while all the prisoners in the Florida State Prison got up and went to work, Baca was on the edge <laughs> in his cell in silence, saying, I'm, I'm a broken reed, I will not play music in this place, I will not be part of the, of the sport of this death song. You know? And while I was in there, in my cell with the warden saying, I will kill you, I will bust your face, I will break every bone, I will kick your teeth in, I will break your jaws. And then he said, to give you a taste of that, the guy in the guards would come in and beat the living shit out of me. And I was the happiest man that ever lived because I was a renunciant innocent. I would just walk around my cell repeating the words that Rex had written, not anybody else. I was just like, and then I would go back to God and I said, well, I guess this book. And then there was this wild, crazy guy from the Lower East Side named Norm Moser. <coughs> Nobody ever heard of the man. But he said in a letter, I'm, uh, I'm from the PBN people in New York. I got your name and I'm writing you. And dude, I'm going to Berkeley in my 65 Chevy and I haven't got no gas. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, Maybe I'll meet this chick in this motel and I don't know them, but if you don't hear from me, it's because I don't love you, brother. It's because I ran out of gas, I ain't got no food, and I got no pencil, all right, you man, love you, bye. And this is my mentor. This is my, this is God looking up to for guidance in life, right? You know what I'm saying? And it's amazing how these beautiful people in my life, and then when I get out, I go to Berkeley and I look up Norm to thank him, and he lives in a room smaller than this, and he's got no food in the cabinet. And everywhere you look, there's no room to sit because there's books everywhere. And he's poor. I'm like, here, let me give you whatever I got, man. Whatever I got, brother. You know? I, because I expect that because of your words and breath and width and your spirit that you lived in a house the size of this theater. But to come to a place that there's only a cot you can sleep on, there's no place to cook, you go over in the morning and you line up with the homeless, you were my teacher. And so every single time, from the National Book Award to the American Book Award to the International Prize, every single thing that had happened to me, it was all these unknown people that were the bent chain links that had broken free, that had been thrown alongside the train track, that were anonymous and different to the world, that were my teachers. And it's such an incredible, incredible honor to be here tonight for Rex, because I, if I can think of nothing else, Rex learned of a way to contain the fierce fury of life. And he'll always remind me of those red flags that fly, you know, up there where all these people, amazing people think, I can climb that mountain. And when you start, you realize halfway you can't. You realize halfway that you're just a miserable piece of mutton that was left on the plate that nobody scooped off after dinner. Not even the dogs wanted you anymore. So you were just left there. And then you realize, well, if I, if I can go into the half a day, I'll do it. You go into the half a day, and you begin to have visions, right? Visions of talking to trees, visions of talking to horses, 
visions of gifts and all these years, your mother's voice, your grandpa, you hear your little sister in Russia call you by your brother's name, and you don't even have a sister, but you know she's your sister. You, you think those are delusions or whatever they are, but you keep climbing and climbing and climbing, and all of a sudden you see a flag. And the flag seems to talk to you in the breeze. actually can look into the mountain lion's eye like I had a week ago, and you don't even, you know he's not going to hurt you. And every time he tries to escape, you tell him, stop, I just want to look in your eye a little more. I want to know why I'm here. And the books of the religious don't have the answer, but your eyes do. Just stay still for a second. And you know he's not going to eat you. You know, it's a phenomenal way of living. When you go out there to the shining stones and you look at it long enough that you see your own reflection. It's amazing. Okay, here's a real quick poem. I just thought I had to say that. Um, here you go. First one. This is a poem to my daughter, a poem to my little son, and I've written other books for my other kids, but uh, <laughs> every doorknob in the house is loose. From Esau I am see that. See, this is just something about what I I've lived a really, really crazy life and uh, faced death many, many times, but at the time I didn't think it was death, I thought it was courage breaking. Um, <laughs> go ahead and shoot me, try it. You got to me and you got jammed. You know, what was I, brave? I didn't even call that stupid, but it was really dumb. But anyway, my heart, this poem, it's like an old doorknob at your grandmother's house. And good Lord knows how many how many kids have pulled and yanked and turned on that doorknob. And how many elderly folks have come in and turned it gently. And how many grown up kids have kicked it and slammed it and pulled it down. But it still opens the door. That's the beauty of it. His heart? Man, he's on the face of doors and it is beat up. I mean, you've got to go to a really old antique store to find something like this. You know? <laughs> and they don't have any screws anywhere to fit. Or keys, the old skeleton keys. The bones don't fit the heart anymore. Every doorknob in the house is loose from Esai and Lucia, running and chasing each other and playing games. Like hide and seek. That's how it should be. That's how life should be used. It should, things should be worn down and broken and mended and reused and fixed. It should be handled and hit and bumped and given to the world and the world's traffic and the world's children, tested as they grow, explored and inspected and gnawed and touched, pulled and slammed, all in the name of innocent growth. Celebrating children's curiosity, the infants intrigued with the world. What's behind the door? The boogeyman, the darkness, the smell of bird shit and baby puke? And after the day's done and the day's bent and disfigured by children's use? One can say as the world goes to sleep that life fills the world. And it's better. It's so much better than a world where children cannot run because they have no legs. Where tricycles smolder and rubble, where stairs crumble because children no longer dream. Where cannon jars and tools lie shattered and melted and radiated blood. Where the young men and women must be fed because they have no hands. Where only the playmates have fear and terror etched in the face. Where nothing grows or is cut down and it's used. Where children learn to count by pointing to the bench bullet cartridges. Where human heads bounce along the street instead of soccer balls. And where children drop bodies on the concrete with no limbs. Where dogs feast on the corpse and words are drowned by bombs. Where, where cuts and bruises and broken limbs go attended as nothing. Where stories are about the day's atrocities and where nightmares have replaced dreams and no one sleeps, and where every game played by children is about death, I say that the children at the doorknobs. <laughs>